All right, y'all, welcome to the show. Please forgive me this morning. My brain is barely functioning, but uh, we're going to roll, roll with the show anyway. So a lot of stuff to get to. We're going to talk about a bizarre pause in Gaza that I'll break down for you. You know, I'm at the point now where I'm so skeptical when anything remotely positive comes out of Gaza that like the bar of evidence that I need in order to conclude something somewhat positive is even happening is super high. So we'll get to that. Uh, then I'll get to fallout after the world central kitchen attack the celebrity chef jose andres has spoken out and he has some scathing words for the idf we'll get to uh some new israeli torture revealed also there's some new information on an israeli ai assassination program as depraved and deplorable as you thought the ai assassination campaign is i can guarantee you it's worse it's worse uh then after that, we'll get to uh, Joe Rogan versus Coleman Hughes. They debated the genocide in Gaza. And uh, Owen Jones destroys an outraged Zionist and dealt with a lot of fake outrage backlash. Then uh, we have some Trump stuff. He says he wants to cut taxes for billionaires again. He's basically begging a judge to jail him and, re and uh, revoke or, or bring about pretrial detention. Um, and Marjorie Taylor Greene later on, she, uh, I mean, what the fuck is there to say about her? Total fucking moron. Um, and going full Christian fundamentalist, weird, magical type nonsense. Anyway, all right, without any further ado, let's go ahead and dive into it here. So let me show you this first. The other day, we got news. Biden called for an immediate ceasefire in a tense call with Netanyahu and warned that if Israel doesn't change policy in Gaza, U.S. policy regarding the war could change. So this was reported from Axios. Now, again, what I will say is immediately I filed this right in the category of like, oh, you mean the 28 other times you did some fake PR finger wagging saying, I don't agree with all of these war crimes. I only agree with some of them. It just I hear this and I'm like, I, I don't care about words. I don't care about these stories. I don't care about rhetoric. I'm at the point where you have to show me tangible action. You have to show me we are cutting off the money and the weapons to Israel. And by the way, at this late date, even that's just a drop in the bucket. The fact of the matter is there should be war crimes charges immediately and massive sanctions on top Israeli officials. Like that's if the world made sense. Well, obviously the world doesn't make sense. Israel is our ally. So we let them get away with almost everything under the sun. So I read this. I didn't think much of it. But interestingly, clearly, um, Something about this was a little bit different than previous instances because the Israeli government felt like, OK, this time the threat from the U.S. of a change in policy seems real. So there were some consequences affiliated with it. Now, at the end of the day, I still file this under the like PR category and you'll see why, because it's not like this change that we just saw is permanent. But then we get this. The Israeli security cabinet approved the opening of the Erez crossing with the Gaza Strip for the first time since October 7th in, in order to allow more humanitarian aid to go in, an Israeli official said. So whatever happened in those discussions between the U.S. government and the Israeli government, the Israeli government felt like, OK, no, they're actually pissed after the World Central Kitchen massacre. And so we got to do something. And it looks like they settled on we'll allow in a little bit more humanitarian aid, at least for now. So again, let's just reflect on this basic fact that we were in a position where the humanitarian aid wasn't getting in. Like, it was just being blocked by Israel. And so, to like praise them for this seems kind of weird, because it's like a serial killer saying, yeah, for a brief amount of time, I'll stop starving um, my prisoners. Like, <laughs> okay, are we supposed to applaud you for that? But having said that, this is a little different than the previous instances where it was just all PR nonsense from Joe Biden. Um, so now, it also in response to the World Central Kitchen massacre, we get this. Um, this Axios reporter says, an IDF investigation concluded that the deadly strike on the World Central Kitchen convoy in Gaza was a serious violation of the Israeli military's rules and operating procedures. So, I mean, I'll make the obvious point here. 
every single day we have massacres of Palestinian civilians. Oftentimes we have pictures and we have videos. We have all the evidence in the world. And you barely hear a peep from the Israeli government or the U.S. government about the specifics of an individual case. And they don't launch an investigation and they don't say, yeah, there was a violation of policy here. The only reason we even get this in this instance is because there were a lot of white Westerners who were murked. And they worked for a celebrity chef who happens to be big in like polite society resistance liberal circles. Okay. But then we get this. Two senior officers were dismissed and three other senior officers, a colonel and two generals, were reprimanded, the IDF announced. The swift investigation and the subsequent decision to take disciplinary steps against top officers shows that the IDF is taking the incident more seriously than previous cases as Israel faces intensifying global scrutiny of its actions in Gaza. So... This is what the IDF did. This is what the Israeli government did in reaction to murking all of those aid workers. So you have two senior officers dismissed and three other senior officers reprimanded. It's more than what we've ever gotten when there's killings of Palestinian civilians, as there is every single day. But again, let's be clear, in a world that made sense, these people would be behind bars these people would be locked up for good. Instead, fired for some and a tough talking to for others. So, again, the bar is so goddamn low that any little thing that we get, people might feel like, oh, thankfully, some movement in the right direction. But I mean, if it's a 100-yard dash, we moved two yards. So don't exactly fly the mission accomplished banner just yet. Um, then we get this times of Israel UN says Israel approved reopening of 20 bakeries and water pipeline in Northern Gaza amid efforts to boost flow of aid into the strip. Humanitarian officials say coordination to be enhanced between military and aid workers, trucks entering from Jordan to be doubled. So, I mean, again, the question you have to ask is, well, hold on now. How the hell were we in a position where Israel was effectively keeping all of these bakeries closed and still doing the medieval siege where they wouldn't, weren't allowing water in through various pipes. So as this person points out, Zachary Foster on Twitter, this headline should read, Israel forcibly shut down 20 bakeries for months as part of its stated war aim to starve millions of Palestinians to death. Then Joe Biden made one phone call. So again... The extent to which we're seeing any little minor changes here in a positive direction is because I think the Israeli government felt like the killing of those World Central Kitchen workers, like actually pissed off the U.S. in a sense that they're worried of losing further support. And so they're making these minor tweaks in order to say, bro, look at us. We're totally humanitarian. I don't even know what you're talking about, bro. But yeah, I mean, all of this is damning with faint praise. All of this is such a goddamn low bar because no country should have been in a position in the first place to have all these bakeries shut down on purpose and to do the medieval siege and cut off the food, fuel, and water for as long as they've done it. Nobody should be able to do that, period. You're talking about a massive civilian population. 30,000 Hamas fighters there are, and there's 2.3 million people in Gaza, and they announced early on a total siege. That shouldn't have even been in the realm of conversation or possibility. But here we are. So some minor changes to the total siege in an attempt to appease Joe Biden and the U.S. government. Okay. Then there's this. Israel's Gaza Strip pullout is just to rest and resupply troops, U.S. intel says. So we got some reports that in some areas of Gaza, the IDF actually pulled out. The Israeli military has withdrawn all of its ground troops from southern Gaza, save for one bridge, in order to rest and refit, U.S. officials say, as the Jewish state returns to the negotiating table with Hamas. They've been on the ground for four months. The word we are getting is they're tired. They need to be refit. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby told ABCs this week, it is really just about rest and refit for these troops, Kirby added, and not necessarily that we can tell indicative of some coming new operation for these troops. So here you can see some of the pictures. Obviously, Gaza has been totally obliterated, completely destroyed. They continue here. It is unclear what the implications of the withdrawal will have on the looming Rafah offensive, with U.S. officials pres pressuring Israel not to move into the crowded city, which is overflowing uh, the Palestinians who fled fighting elsewhere in the territory without a robust plan to avoid civilian casualties. The IDF said that 
The Nahal Bridge will be the only unit remaining in Gaza on Sunday, stationed at the so-called Netzarim Corridor, corridor which do- divides the Palestinian enclave. The position will allow the remaining soldiers to carry out raids in northern and central Gaza, as well as facilitate the delivery of aid to the enclave's northern half. So, look, by their own admission here, they're saying, yeah, we pulled out of some areas, but it's only temporary. It's only temporary. So, I mean, the good, the good side of that is, good, get, get the fuck out. The bad side of that is, well, what the hell is coming next? Because apparently there's been, well, this is the reporting. There's been a lot of disagreement between the U.S. and the Israeli government uh, about a Rafa offensive. And um, there was some reporting that there was a top Israeli official who was like yelling at Anthony Blinken, making the case for we're going to do a Rafa offensive. So, again... Positive that they're out, but this is not lasting. And, you know, every single time we think something moves even in a slightly positive direction, it gets rolled back instantly. So I'll also show you this. Now, grain of salt, massive grain of salt, okay? 322 aid trucks entered Gaza today. It is the highest daily number of aid trucks that entered the enclave since October 7th, Israeli officials tell me. The part that you should be uh, really focused on here is Israeli officials tell me. Yeah. Israeli officials. So, I don't fucking trust them even in the slightest bit. So, is this true? I hope it's true. But remember, we've been dealing with facts on the ground where, according to, you know, reporting from months ago, about 70% of the aid that was supposed to get into Gaza has been blocked by the IDF. 70%. They unload every truck before they put the stuff back on. And uh, 70% of the time, if there's one thing in the truck they don't like, they turn the whole truck around. Doesn't matter how much food is being turned around. Doesn't matter how much medicine is being turned around. It's just, hey, you have a tent in the truck. The tent has pipes that could theoretically be used for a a weapon. So therefore, you got to turn the whole thing around. So now, I guess the point here is they have um, started rejecting fewer trucks. But 322 aid trucks is uh, not going to make a fucking dent in what needs to happen here. So everything in context, everything in perspective, um, you know, what do you make of this? I don't know. You guys tell me. But I just see them as slightly letting the boot off the neck before they likely press down even harder because that's what all the trends have been. The best predictor of future action is past action and past action is outright genocidal. All right, so now um, now we switch gears. I told you all of the uh, somewhat positive developments, the things that, at least in theory and on paper, are slight movements in the right direction. But now I'll show you the bad. Permission to kill 20 civilians for one low-level Hamas commander. An automated system called Where's Daddy to ensure that targets are bombed while at home with their family. So there's uh, a new Plus 972 magazine report that came out, and um, they dive into the specifics of an Israeli AI program and how it's used. I'll read you from some of this. The Israeli army systematically attacked the targeted individuals while they were in their homes, usually at night, while their whole families were present, rather than during the course of military activity. According to the sources, this was because from what they regarded as an intelligence standpoint, it was easier to locate the individuals in their private houses. Additional automated systems, including one called Where's Daddy, also revealed here for the first time, were used specifically to track the targeted individuals and carry out bombings when they had entered their families' residences. So yes, you heard that properly. They wait for them to go home, and then they decide to attack, knowing, hey, their wife and their kids are with them, and you're going to get a whole bunch of civilians to get one Hamas fighter. This is as depraved as depraved can be. So clearly, the stuff that they put into the AI says, we don't really care about civilian casualties. Because if you told the AI, don't get any civilian casualties, this is the last thing they would do, is get them when they're at home with their families. They continue here. In an unprecedented move, according to two of the sources, the army also decided during the first weeks of, of the war that for every junior Hamas operative that Lavender marked, it would, that's, I think, the name of one of the AI programs, It was permissible to kill up to 15 or 20 civilians. In the past, the military did not authorize any collateral damage during assassinations of low-ranking militants. The sources added that in the event that the target was a senior Hamas 
official with the rank of battalion or brigade commander, the army on several occasions authorized the killing of more than 100 civilians in the assassination of a single commander. So you guys remember uh, when this was pretty early on, I want to say it was a few weeks, maybe a month at most into this, there was a refugee camp that was bombed to smithereens. And there was like 100 or 200 people who died. And the IDF went on CNN and quite literally said, we were trying to get one Hamas commander. And even Wolf Blitzer was shocked and he was like, wait, what? You're, you're okay with 100 or 200 dead civilians to get one Hamas commander? And the IDF was basically like, yes. So they're making these decisions and they're also using AI. And my speculation on that is the AI portion is for them to try to turn around and wash their hands of any accountability by saying, hey, we weren't even really making the decision. We left it up to this highly intelligent AI and the AI told us to shoot. So we were shooting. So no, no human being was responsible. It was the machine. It's a way to say, well, who, who are you going to imprison? Who are you going to jail? Even if these are war crimes, it's not our fault. This is really, really dark stuff, man. This is really dark. So now we get, um, this is really interesting, a uh, piece on CNN here with quite an admission about what's happening on the ground. Listen to this. And Netanyahu's response is often, well, this stuff happens. I mean, that, he said that about this strike. He said that about the shooting of an Israeli guy who was trying to stop a terror attack. He said that multiple times. Yeah, and we, this is why this incident shouldn't come as a surprise. You know, you remember that just a few weeks ago, three Israeli hostages that managed to escape their captors were killed by Israeli soldiers who, who fired at them even though they were uh, holding uh, a white flag, okay? And, you know, I spoke to um, uh, an Israeli reserve officer who was in the same unit of those soldiers who shot those hostages. And I remember him telling me that the orders are basically from the commanders on the ground is just shoot every man in fighting age. Those are the orders, but those are, but that's not the rules of engagement that is coming from the IDF leadership. But on the ground, that's what they're being told. Exactly. And this is the same thing. The, at the end of the day, the battalion commander or the brigade commander, I don't know who authorized this strike, he interprets differently the orders that are coming from the IDF com, uh, headquarters in Tel Aviv. Rock Ravid, appreciate it. So in other words, let me break that down for you. Even in a situation where you have a rigid chain of command, very clear rules, and people at the top who are concerned about collateral damage and killing civilians, even in a scenario where all of these boxes are checked, like it is the platonic ideal, the, the example of theoretical perfection of how a war should function, even in that scenario, when you, when you get the orders coming down from the top and it goes through another level or two, uh, by the time you get to the third person, it's like a game of telephone. And they might interpret what they've been told a little differently and they will make the executive decision in the moment as to how to pursue proceed whether or not to fire and look in the case of israel i'll go a step further you don't have this uh you know platonic ideal of the way a war should function with all these rules and the people at the top uh, caring about civilians i think it really is like shoot from the hip let's go gun down everything in sight type stuff but certainly as you go down that chain of command and you get to the people who are on the battlefield, oftentimes, as they're reporting here, it's just like, hey, kill anything that moves. Certainly any military age men. And you wonder why people call it a genocide. We just did the story about uh, daddy's home, the AI that says, hey, kill them when they get into their houses and they got their kids around and their wife around. We just heard that story. So killing women and children on purpose, in theory to get one Hamas guy, and then here it's just on the ground, hey, just shoot. And this is perfectly consistent with the stories that we heard on October 7th, too. Do you guys remember these? They even had it on an Israeli news program where one high-ranking officer was like, hey, go ahead and fire on this kibbutz. And the, and the soldier was like, but aren't there civilians in there? And they go, I don't know, shoot anyway. So that's what's happening. And again, with Israel, I go a step further. I don't even buy the idea that it's like well-meaning, but then it gets watered down and it's a game of telephone, then they end up killing civilians. <laughs> I think from the top down, it's, hey, man, they're all guilty enough. Why do I believe that? Because that's their own words. We've seen how many examples of top-ranking Israeli 
military officials and government officials outright say the genocidal things. We, there are no innocent civilians in Gaza. You know, hey, they had an opportunity to overthrow Hamas. They haven't overthrown Hamas. They agree with Hamas. They are Hamas, so they're all guilty enough. Really dark yet again. All right, this one is uh, a new nightmare unlocked. We've talked about the various uh, forms of torture that are going on with these Palestinian political prisoners. By the way, there are thousands of Palestinian hostages. Thousands. And they don't get talked about nearly enough. But the, you know, we've been talking a lot about the Israeli hostages, certainly in mainstream media. Their big uh, focal point, it's like, hey, are you going to make a deal to get all of them back, etc.? Nobody even talks about the thousands of Palestinian hostages. Listen to this from Mohammed Shahada, who's the chief of communications for Euroman Monitor, the human rights group. Hostages are having their legs amputated from being zip tied by all four limbs for months. They're being forced to defecate in diapers and fed through straws. Those are Gazan hostages at Israeli Sadi Taman concentration camp. So you won't see one word about it in Western media. Now, to be fair, um, CNN actually did have a piece about uh, the zip ties leading to amputations for people because they've been zip tied literally for months. Cuts off the flow of the blood, uh, you know, and there's no choice but to amputate. And then you can see here, this was a Haaretz article ori originally. Two prisoners had their legs amputated due to handcuff injuries, says a doctor at an Israeli prison facility who describes deplorable conditions and violations of medical ethics and the law in a letter to ministers and the attorney general. So this is the type of care that's being given to these Palestinian political prisoners and hostages. Leave them zip-tied there for months. Let them shit on themselves. This is, it says fed through straws. Those are the ones who are lucky enough to even be fed. It's, it's, this is a horror. It's a horror show. So dark, man. I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say in response to this. I mean, for the people who are still defending Israel, what they have to do is just pretend like all these stories that I'm laying out for you don't exist. Don't acknowledge them. Pretend they're not real. Don't engage and move on and keep making your standard fortune cookie ass talking points. All right. So uh, according to, Euro to Euromed Monitor, there are... Uh, they have testimony of Israeli army perpetrated robberies and looting around Al Shifa medical complex. So there was a giant massacre at Al Shifa that we talked about in the past. We covered a specific story of 13 kids who were killed. Euromed Monitor has um, highlighted all of that. But there's also a tremendous amount of evidence of robberies and looting around Al Shifa. So you have. Uh, these IDF soldiers go into houses of some Palestinians who previously were uh, better off economically, some of the more prosperous families in Gaza, and uh, they go and they take whatever sort of necklaces or rings or uh, anything that's valuable that's laying around, the IDF will steal them. And in some instances, they are literally bragging about stealing them. So, um, you know... It's compared to all the other stuff, it almost seems like it's not as big of a deal when you compare it to the torture and the massacres. But it does really um, make an important point, which is there's no way anybody can spin this in any way, shape, or form that this has to do with Hamas or this has to do with defending Israel. This is full on like, we fully dehumanize these people. We don't think they have any rights. And so... We're giving ourselves the ability to be pirates and get away with it. We are allowing ourselves to be criminals because it doesn't really count as a crime if the crime is being committed against a subhuman. Now does it. So it's they've been fully dehumanized and there is no theoretical argument you could even make to say, oh, this is really taking it to Hamas. To give you guys an update, We've now crossed the 41,000 number in total deaths. Um, about 37,600 of the dead are civilians. You have uh, 15,370 children who've been killed. We're getting close to the 10,000 mark for women who've been killed. 
Injuries are now up above 77,000. And remember, this is at the same time that the hospital system has completely collapsed. 136 journalists have been killed, and that is the deadliest conflict for journalists in human history. It's almost like they're being targeted on purpose. Almost like they're being targeted on purpose. You still have 2 million Palestinians displaced. That's of 2.3 million total uh, in Gaza. Over 122,000 homes have been completely destroyed. And over 269,000 homes have been partially destroyed. Another way of saying that is Gaza has effectively been wiped off the map. And then they go on here. 443 schools have been damaged. Uh, I'm sure if you ask Israel, they'll say all 443 schools were Hamas command and control centers. Um, you have 2,217 destroyed industrial facilities, so like factories, places of employment, um, 647 damaged mosques, 869 healthcare professionals have been injured, including 349 killed. 301 healthcare facilities have been damaged, including 29 hospitals, 69 cl clinics, and 203 ambulances. Then you got 200 heritage sites that have been destroyed. And remember, the heritage sites, that's like places that go back thousands of years with a lot of uh, religious and historical significance. Israel's just destroying them. Um, and then you have civil defense workers, 198 injured, 42 killed, 156 injured. And then now the number of Palestinians who are hostages in their own respect in Israel is 3, 000, uh, over 3,800. So, And remember, all the, these new updates are very few and far between to come out now because it's so hard to do the work on the ground because Gaza's destroyed, the hospital system has collapsed, so many of the people who were helpful in getting these numbers are dead or injured. So now we get an update, you know, shit, like once a month or something like that. But this is the most recent update. Um, I think these numbers are way more accurate than the UN numbers that you get or even the numbers from the other human rights groups because this includes people who are presumed dead under the rubble because they've been there for an extended period of time. So I think these are probably the most accurate numbers coming out of Gaza. And of course, it's an absolute horror show. All right, we got this. Pro-Israel tech tools are auto-generating misinformation about Palestine and flooding the internet with them and encouraging users to falsely report anything that harms Israel's image as hate speech. Nathan J. Robinson here says, if Russia or China was doing this, there'd be an uproar. So they have this massive propaganda machine filling the internet with misinformation. So when it comes to Biden's campaign, not a great sign for Biden's campaign that he's having to return contributions to any prospective event attendee that his staff deems to be a potential pro-Palestine activist. So they see who's going to show up to one of their campaign events, and in some instances they're like, nope, this person might protest, kick their ass out. Really strong and healthy campaign you're running there. Really strong and healthy campaign. You're really in touch with the people. Uh, let me show you this clip of uh, Bassem Youssef, who has family in Palestine, and he makes some great points on CNN. Watch. You have family in Gaza, your wife's family, your in-laws are there, right? Yes. And tell me, can you talk to them? No, uh, I mean, I've been touring, so it's been difficult. It's been difficult enough for them to be in touch with my wife and her family. But the thing is, uh, they have like many families there, like cousins and uncles, and they all left their houses in San Yunus and Gaza and Northern Gaza. And now they are in one apartment, in one building in Rafah, sharing it with 25, 25 other families. And, you know, at any moment we can hear a, a bomb drop. But it's OK because Israel will apologize, I'm sure, as they all usually do. I mean, like I was so happy to listen to their sincere apology for killing the people from Central Kitchen. Oh, my God. Like. The, the pain that they have to go through. I mean, even the, one of their spokesmen tweeted on Twitter, like, see what Hamas made me do. It's like, it is so, so interesting. And the thing is, um, what's really, for me, what's very interesting is the outrage, the global outcry. It's like, oh, how could you do that, Israel? But it's like every time, it's like, oh, Hamas did it. Oh, we did it. We're so sorry. There will be absolutely no accountability of what they did in Gaza for the past six months. This is what pains me. Do you not think the tone is changing, given the mounting Sli death toll? Slightly, in Gaza. but it, it, is, it is performative performative rage, like the, the world readers are so enraged about Israel killing the seven workers. And, like, you know, we, we talk about that, but I find that there's more rage about killing seven foreign workers more than the rage about well, killing 30,000 Palestinians. I mean, look, remember we, when we, we say killing, that. Remember when 30,000 30, was too much? Remember when 3,000 Palestinians was too much? Yeah. You know what happened? 3, 000, you know, tomorrow, if 300,000 Palestinians kill, nobody will care. Nobody will care. Numbers don't mean anything. Why anymore. do you think that is? Because they don't look at Palestinians as equal human beings. I Unfortunately, 
true and devastating. And then finally, I'll end on this one here. So NBC News tweeted, Gaza universities embodied the ambitions of young Palestinians. In weeks, the Israeli military destroyed them. So by the way, just a quick note on this. They say in we it took weeks for Israel's military to destroy them. We're now months into this. So where was this article earlier? Right? Where was this article earlier? It's like everybody passes their threshold of what's acceptable, like seemingly very late. We knew like two weeks into this. Like, eh, this kind of, isn't ethnic cleansing and a genocide? That's exactly what this looks like. That's what all the evidence shows. Listen to what they're saying. Look at what they're doing. Here we are way, way past the time when all these universities were destroyed. They're like, huh, all the universities are destroyed. You know, it's like, remember when, when uh, there was a big debate online about whether or not a particular hospital was attacked by Israel. And then fast forward to today, and every hospital has either been damaged or destroyed by Israel in Gaza. Everyone. And there were people, uh, Israel would never attack a hospital. Funny, the people who were saying that have not given you the update that every single hospital is now destroyed. Here, in fact, I know I just showed you the numbers, but now I'm going to show you the numbers one more time. Um, healthcare facilities. 29 hospitals. 29 hospitals have been attacked. 69 clinics, 203 ambulances. Weird, they were, when one was attacked, they were, yeah, Israel would never do that. Have they said anything about the, the last 28 of them that have been attacked? Yeah, I didn't think so. All right, so that's the NBC News article. Hey, at least they're covering it. I'm happy they're covering it. Should have been a long time ago, but they're covering it. Uh, here's what Abe Greenwald, executive editor, editor of At Commentary Magazine, says. The most encouraging thing I've seen on a university campus in a long time. It doesn't take much for some people to just come out of the closet and be like, I believe Nazi things. I like Nazi things. I like genocide. I like destruction of infrastructure and ethnic cleansing. There's so many people who've come out of the closet, effectively, as Nazis in reaction to what's happening in Gaza. It's astonishing. I naively thought there were some lines where everybody agreed, hey, never never cross that, right? Nobody should be apologizing for genocide. Nobody should be making excuses and deflecting and obfuscating when it comes to something as serious as ethnic cleansing and genocide. Wrong. Because there are plenty of people who just pretend like it's not happening. And then there's also plenty of people who will look at genocidal actions and be like, I support that. Where the fuck is our humanity? Holy shit. So uh, there are your updates on Gaza. We'll see how long this temporary pause uh, lasts for. But, um, you know, I'm going to need to see a lot more from the U.S. on this front. It's not enough to do a threatening phone call and uh, slightly roll back the oppression, allow in some more aid trucks, turn on a water pipe, open up one crossing. It's not enough. What I'm going to need to see is cutting off all the money and all the weapons to Israel. What I'm going to need to see is sanctioning the government officials and the military. Ideally, what I'm going to need to see is all the people who are perpetrating these war crimes locked up for good. Not going to hold my breath for that, but um, we're in a dangerous time right now. We're in a dangerous time because we just saw Israel attack an Iranian embassy in Syria killing the person who was the replacement for Qasem Soleimani. That is, it's not even debatable. That is a war crime. That is an attack on Iran. And so now we're all sitting here and waiting to see, is Iran going to retaliate? You know, what about Hezbollah and Lebanon? Like, what's going to happen here? And um, there's a lot of rumors floating around, things that I can't necessarily verify. There was one thing floating around that said, the U.S. talked to Iran and basically said, you know, if you retaliate, we're not going to get involved on the side of Israel. Again, that's pure speculation. I don't know if that's true. My instinct is the exact opposite, that the U.S. probably would jump in. Um, and there are some other rumors floating around out there about an ultimatum that Iran laid out for Israel in the U.S. saying, if you do a permanent ceasefire, we won't uh, retaliate. But if you don't, we will. Again, that's pure speculation. I haven't been able to verify that. I haven't seen legit sources report that out. But this is uh, definitely a crucial and devastating and scary moment, that's for sure. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop. 
and watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.